बिहाफ ऑफ साइंस सिटी कोलकाता माई सेल्फ शुभ शंकर घोष वुड लाइक टू इन्वाइट एवरी वन टू दिस वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वेबिनार एंड द नेम ऑफ दिस वेबिनार इज द मैथ्स ऑफ पैंडेमिक experts predict that the third wave is set to arrive anywhere between september and october but again another group of experts say that it may take some more time whenever it arrives the point of worry is we may again witness 4 to 5 lakh cases every day during the third wave if the predictions of the experts are true but how are experts arriving at these figures is it a guesswork or a result of hardcore science and calculations to know these answers and to know more about it we have among us the famous mathematician dr sitar sinha let us know a little bit about him dr sinha is a professor of theoretical physics and dean of computational biology graduate program at the institute of mathematical sciences chennai and was earlier also adjunct faculty of the national institute of advanced studies nias bangalore and department of computer science indian institute of technology kharagpur he did his phd at the indian statistical institute kolkata and post doctoral research at the indian institute of science bangalore and the well medical college of cornell university new york city joining the faculty of imsc in 2002 his research falls broadly under complex systems non linear dynamics and statistical physics with application to systems biology economic and social sciences and computational linguistics recently he worked extensively on this covid pandemic and how the different pandemic model works so without taking any more time i invite dr shita bhusena to deliberate and enrich us with the different kind of models that he is working sir thank you shubho it's a pleasure to be here and uh, i welcome everyone to this talk in which uh, we will see how mathematics can actually help us in getting some insights about pandemics covid in particular so pandemics are of course very much in our mind uh, ever since it started sometime towards the end of 2019 covid has spread through almost all the countries of the world uh by the latest count there are about 240 million confirmed cases overall uh and we have had almost 4.5 million people dying of it and there is probably not a single country in the world which has escaped the ravage of covid so far in india of course we are uh, also suffered and suffering uh, from the disease and as of today there are 3.27 crore confirmed cases with so far uh, we have had 4.37 lakh deaths now how did we get to this situation so if you look at the first wave of the covid epidemic in india we find that you know its beginning was fairly innocuous so the first confirmed case was reported on january 30 2020 when a student returning from wuhan university in china was found to be covid positive uh the student was of course immediately uh, segregated and subsequently recovered without infecting anyone else uh we continue to have you know a few scattered cases here and there but luckily we managed to isolate each of these cases until 4th of march last year when suddenly 23 new cases which included 14 italian tourists were found 
at the South Delhi Hotel, and simultaneously, six family members who lived in Agra were also found to be positive with COVID, who were actually infected by a person in Delhi who had earlier been found to be positive. So from March of last year, essentially the infection really started making inroads into the population. And if you look at the day by day spread of the disease in March last year, we find that from fairly innocuous beginnings, it very rapidly started spreading into the local population. So if you look at this graphic, you find that most of the initial cases were of people who had either flown from abroad, who were Indian citizens who had flown from abroad, or they were foreign citizens who were coming to India as tourists or on business purposes. However, starting from, you know, right about the second week of March, uh, we found that more and more people who were resident of India, who had not gone anywhere abroad, but had actually contracted disease inside India, started rising until by the end of the month, more or less the majority of the cases turned out to be of the native population. And to counter this, of course, at the end of March, we had the imposition of a hitherto unprecedented public health measure, namely the lockdown at the national level. Now, one of the big questions that people often you know, ask is that, how is it that epidemics seem to go out of hand so fast? You know, in early March, there were, you know, just a handful of cases, you know, maybe cases in single digits. Even on, uh, you know, March uh, first week when we had, you know, maybe 23 new cases, you know, it just had double digits. How did it, you know, get to, you know, essentially hundreds to thousands of cases by the end of the month? So this is not just true for India. It's true for countries across the world, and it's not even just unique for COVID. All epidemics have this property that the number of infected people start out at very low values and very rapidly go up to extremely high numbers. Just to give you an idea of the numbers we're talking about, in Italy, during the first wave of the COVID pandemic uh, in January last year, the number of infected cases went from only 20 on January 21 to 453 on January 26. So that's a 20 times increase in just five days. What is the secret of this rapid growth of epidemics? If you think about it, it's nothing but the same trick which leads people to put their money in the bank so that it grows by compound interest. Essentially, it's the power of exponential growth through geometric progression. It is what happens when you take a number and you keep multiplying it by a constant factor over and over again. We can understand it by a legend, a very popular legend around the temple of Ambalapura in Kerala, where the legend goes that there was a very miserly king who didn't want to spend any money for the upkeep of his citizens of the, you know, of their kingdom. And so Krishna disguised himself as a sage and appeared in the court of the king and challenged him to a game of chess. So the sage said to the king that if I win, uh, you don't really have to give me all that bigger prize. Just, you know, give me something as follows. You give me one grain of rice for the first square of the chessboard, two grains of rice for the second square of the chessboard, four grains of rice for the third square, eight grains of the rice, eight on the fourth square, and so on. So you double the grains until you reach the 64th square. So the king thought this was a very modest request and started playing. And of course, you know, when you play against Krishna, you're guaranteed to lose. So the king lost, and then as per promise, he was asked by the sage to give the required number of grains. So the king asked his treasurer to bring the required number of grains, 
And that's when all hell broke loose. So initially there was no problem. For the first square, one grain was produced. For the second square, two grains. For the third, four. For the fourth square, eight. For the fifth square, 16. For the sixth square, 32. And so on and so forth, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, 8192, 16,384. And by the time you come to the 16 square, that's like 32,768. And now the treasurer is you know, starting to scratch his head. Is the, did the king make a very bad bargain? And so you know, he just starts counting and by the time he comes to the 21st square, he realizes that he's giving out a million grains. And we still have to go up to 64 squares. So the king, his minister, and the treasurer start now counting how many grains that they're actually going to have to give to the sage. And they realize that to meet the request, the so-called modest request of the sage, they'll have to give a, just an enormous quantity of grains, which essentially comes to like hundreds of trillions cages of rice. The kingdom simply doesn't have that much rice. Eventually, of course, the king, you know, bargained with the sage and, you know, promised to give his uh, citizens as much rice as they wanted. And that was the end of that. But this simple story illustrates the power of multiplying by a single number over and over again. And by the way, our own Shukumar Rai also has a beautiful story called Daniel Hisheb, which essentially uses exactly the same idea. How multiplying just by two can quickly build up to enormous numbers. In the case of epidemics, we so see a very similar story. Imagine that initially there was only one infected person who arrives from some distant parts. Imagine further that this person can actually infect two other before he or she recovers. Now, these two people who have been infected in turn can infect two other people each. Each of those people who are infected can infect further two other people each. So in a short time, you find that from the initial case where you have just one infected person, you have two, then four, then eight, then 16, and very soon you have more than a thousand people who are actually infected. Now you might argue that, hold on a second, I mean, you know, this is not, uh, you know, guaranteed that you would always be able to exactly infect two people. Yes, true. In reality, every infected person will not be able to pass on the infection to exactly the same number of people. Sometimes you'll be lucky and the infected person will not be able to infect anyone else. The infected person will just recover without being able to infect anyone else. Sometimes you'd be unlucky and the infected person maybe would be able to infect more than two people. You know? So you'd be able to infect maybe four or maybe six. So what we're talking about is the mean number of other people that a single infected person can infect. And so let's look at this picture where you start off with a single infected person and that person infects two others. Of these two, this person can infect only one other person while this person recovers without being able to infect anyone else. Now let's look at this person who was infected in the third generation, so to say. And this person is able to infect two others. Now of these two, this person then goes on to infect three, while this person goes on to infect only one. So in this generation, you have four people who have been totally infected. And then this person goes on to infect two. This person cannot infect anyone before recovering. This person goes on to infect one, and this person goes on to infect two. And so if you look at each generation of infections, so if you call this the first generation, the second generation, the sec third generation, and so on, you find that the number of people who are infected by each infected person fluctuates from generation to generation, but eventually you can actually talk about 
an average growth rate. And that average turns out to be a very important quantity when we are trying to estimate the rate of spread of an epidemic, when we are trying to figure out how bad an epidemic is going to turn out to be. So this rapidity with which an epidemic grows is essentially measured by a number called R0, the basic reproduction number, which is nothing but what we just saw. It's the mean number or the average number of new infections which are caused by a single infectious individual in a population which is otherwise completely susceptible. That is, no one has been so far exposed to the disease and so therefore no one has any resistance to the disease. So this is the situation when you have an epidemic beginning for the first time when people have not been so far exposed to the pathogen. So you have essentially a completely susceptible population and the disease is going to spread at the fastest possible rate in this initial situation because there is essentially no resistance of the people to the invasion of the pathogen. And so what we typically see is that initially during the outbreak of an epidemic, there is an exponential growth phase after which there is a saturation when essentially the epidemic runs out of steam. So this can come about for many reasons. It could be that you no longer have enough number of susceptible people left in the population, or it could be that control measures have been taken so that it's far more difficult for the pathogen to jump from an infected individual to a susceptible individual. And at that point, the number of recoveries per unit time outnumbers the number of people who are freshly infected. And so the total number of people who are currently infected with the disease starts decreasing. Eventually, it could either die out or it could become endemic, or as we now know, it could also bounce into a second wave if there are still enough number of susceptible people left in the population. So this basic reproduction number is something that you calculate essentially for all diseases and it tells us how quickly a particular disease can spread over time. So for example, for hepatitis C, the R0 is 2. It's also 2 for Ebola. Now Ebola, which is of course uh, extremely deadly disease, uh, you might say, hold on, if Ebola is only two, you know, so, so, you know, a person infected by Ebola is at most going to, you know, on average infect about two other people, it's not really spreading that fast. So why is it that the World Health Organization starts getting into a tizzy the moment Ebola is reported in some Central African country? What is so special about Ebola? I mean, if there's a report of a hepatitis C outbreak, World Health Organization doesn't start sending emergency teams there. Why is Ebola special? And that's because the basic production number only tells you how quickly a disease spreads. It doesn't tell you about how deadly it is. For that, we use another number called the case fatality rate, which tells you that if you are afflicted with the disease, how likely are you to die? So for example, if you have a disease which has a case fatality rate of greater than 50%, which is the case for Ebola, it means that if you catch the disease, you have you know, more than probability of half of dying eventually. Now that's what makes Ebola deadly. It's not because it spreads very rapidly. It's because if you catch it, the certainty of your death uh, essentially makes it, you know, an extremely deadly disease, which is something which we don't want to spread any further than wherever it has had an outbreak. And so we find, if we can look at the other diseases that HIV AIDS has a basic production number of four. So is it for the case of SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Mumps has a basic production number of 10. Measles has a whooping basic production number of 18. And so the higher the number is, the more contagious it is. So you know, if you have a single case of measles, it means that on average, 
that person is going to infect 18 others as compared to let's say you know ebola where the infected person is going to infect only about two others now this also you know make may make you wonder that hold on all these numbers they are greater than one you know you have two four ten eighteen what about less than one don't you have diseases which are have are less than one basic production number less than one well it turns out that in order for a disease to be an epidemic the basic production number has to be greater than one one is a magic number if your basic production number becomes greater than one that means over time the number of cases are going to increase if it is less than one it means over time the number of cases is going to actually decrease and since epidemic necessarily means that the number of infected cases are growing over time by definition r not has to be greater than one now what about the r not for covid so for the case of india during the first wave we actually estimated this number by trying to fit this rate of exponential growth on an actual number of cases that were observed from day to day and we found the number which was close to 2 so you can see that you know it's uh, somewhat towards the lower end of the spectrum now it turns out that when you look at the base production number computed for other regions around the world it actually varies it can fluctuate from somewhere between 1.4 to something close to 3.6. So if you look at uh, this graphic, for example, you find that uh, Iran, for example, uh, recorded a base production number of you know, around 3.5 or 3.6. Uh, the United States recorded a base production number of around 2.7. Uh, Italy had you know, around the same value, maybe 2.8. Uh, so did Spain. Uh, Canada had slightly lower values of about 2.3. Great Britain, France had values slightly lower of about 2.2. South Asian countries, by and large, actually struck lucky. They typically had the lowest range of reproduction numbers. So India, as I mentioned, had it slightly higher than 1.8. Sri Lanka and Pakistan had around 1.5, the sole exception being Bangladesh, which had a basic production number of about three. Now you might ask, hold on a second, it's the same disease. Why is it that you get different values for different countries? Well, in order to understand why this is the case, we have to look at deeper into the mathematics of understanding epidemics. But before that, let's just look at what possible utility calculating this basic production number might give us. For one, it actually helps us to project forward the number of cases we will see in the future. So for example, if you look at the case of India, then starting from 4th March, you can see that it was essentially growing exponentially and what I'm showing here is what in terms of mathematics we call a semi-logarithmic graph paper. So while the horizontal axis shows time in normal scale, in the vertical axis, I'm showing the number of active cases in a so-called logarithmic axis. The benefit of doing this is that exponential growth then can manifest at just a linear curve, just a straight line. So this straight line in a semi-log graph paper essentially implies that it was an exponential growth of the number of cases. Now, if I project forward, you know, if I just extrapolate this line, which is this, you know, red curve that you see, you can see that had the original rate of growth continued, we would have seen essentially a million active cases by 13th of May. But that's not what happened, right? So by 13th of May, in reality, we had, you know, less than 10,000 uh, or more like, you know, uh, something like, I would say 50,000 cases. What happened? 
Of course, what happened was the lockdown, an unprecedented public health intervention measure. And you can see that, you know, within a couple of weeks after it was instituted, so, you know, it came in force somewhere, you know, around, um, I would guess, 24th or 23rd of March. And within, you know, the, the end of the first week of April, you can see that there was a discernible deviation in the curve and it bent away from the projection that people had of the original rate of growth and you had a much lower rate of growth, which essentially you know, kept decreasing further and further until by September, essentially the number of active cases actually started going down. And so by doing this calculation, by estimating R0, we can actually work out how many people are likely to be affected given the current rate of growth. So given this you know, clear utility of analyzing epidemics, it's clear that uh, data analysis and modeling actually can play a very important role in combating epidemics by understanding what are the factors that determine the outcome of an epidemic and what determines the success or maybe the failure of efforts to contain it. Now, analyzing the data of epidemics is not a new enterprise. It has a long history going back to the 19th century. So essentially, there was a cholera outbreak in Victorian London where a single pump at Broad Street was essentially infecting a whole number of people who were actually getting water from this pump. But it took the genius of John Snow, who was a doctor, to realize that it must be that there's a localized cause which is causing this sudden outbreak of cholera. So what it did is that he actually looked at the geographical incidence of the cholera cases and he found that because it was already known that cholera actually spreads through water, if he looks at where these people actually got their water from, he found that although there were quite a few pumps around this area, the cases, most of the cases were clustered around this particular pump. And this allowed him to essentially predict that it must be this particular water pump in Broad Street, which is somehow responsible for the spread of cholera. And he asked public health authorities to essentially make it inaccessible to the public. And sure enough, when the pump handle was removed, that immediately reduced the disease burden. Eventually, when people went and dug up the pump, they realized that this entire infection you know, series was caused by the diaper of a child who had been infected with cholera being dumped in a leaky cesspool near the pump, which had infected this water source and which in turn caused the pump to essentially become the source of a major cholera infection. But of course, this type of you know, insights are very specific to a particular epidemic. So, we call this type of analysis descriptive analysis because you are actually looking at an epidemic after it has happened, and then you're trying to analyze what could be the underlying cause. But what we really like is to be able to figure out how far an epidemic is likely to spread its tentacles. And to do that, we need to understand the mechanism by which epidemics grow. And for this kind of a mechanism-based understanding, we need to turn to modeling. So the pioneer of modeling epidemics turns out to be a very unlikely figure. So the person who is the pioneer of introducing modeling in epidemics is a fairly unlikely person. And he is someone who is fairly familiar with those of us who are from India. It's a Ronald Ross who won the second ever Nobel Prize in medicine for his discovery that malaria spreads through mosquitoes biting humans. And then once they are infected by the blood of a 
you know, human who's already infected prior with malaria, they pass on the infection to other humans by biting people who have not yet been infected. So it turns out that this doctor, you know, who was uh, essentially in the colonial medical service in India, also happened to be an amateur mathematician of sorts. And it's interesting that uh, Sir Ronald Ross is arguably uh, possibly the first Nobel Prize from Kolkata, as one of my teachers used to say. Uh, his path-breaking discovery connecting mosquitoes to uh, the human transmission of malaria actually took place in a laboratory in essentially PG hospital. So anybody who has walked past you know, the PG hospital boundary might have seen this memorial archway, which commemorates this famous work of Ronald Ross. Essentially, there was a laboratory here in which in 1898, he discovered that malaria is propagated by mosquitoes. And of course, if you're a fan of the writings of Amitabha Ghosh, you must be very familiar with the book, The Calcutta Chromosome, in which, of course, Sir Ronald Ross is a protagonist. So Ross, you know, after winning the Nobel Prize for discovering this, you know, how exactly malaria is propagated, became uh, essentially a, you know, propagator of, you know, with a big zeal to essentially eradicate malaria. And he realized that in order to eradicate malaria, you have to control the population of mosquitoes. Now, this might seem like, you know, kind of a very common knowledge now, but in Ross's time, the popular wisdom was that you know, it's impossible to kill off all mosquitoes and therefore, you know, why try? Uh, as a British Army officer once told Ross, you know, Mosquitoes are also God's creations. God must have put them on earth for some very specific reason. So why should we you know, try to put a spanner into God's work? So since it's impossible to eliminate all mosquitoes, uh, you know, it's impossible to eliminate malaria by controlling the insect. So Ross initially tried to convince people by doing pilot projects. So in Sierra Leone, uh, where there was a British colony uh, and malaria was rampant among the colonists as well as the native population, Ross tried to convince people to, you know, do a mosquito control drive. Now, it went on for a year and it certainly reduced the number of malaria cases, but not to the extent where, you know, when the time came whether to invest more money into the malaria into mean, the mosquito control drive, people argued that it was probably not worthwhile to you know, continue funding this drive. And so Ross realized that he may not be able to actually prove this by just doing experiments because there simply wasn't enough public will and money available to carry out a long enough experiment where you can convince people that indeed Mosquito control is the secret to eliminating malaria. So he turned his attention to try to show this using mathematics by doing what we call a thought experiment. So he asked that, is it possible to control malaria even if you cannot actually kill off all mosquitoes? And he showed using a very simple argument that indeed you can. So he very grandly called it his mosquito theorem and the argument goes something like this. So he said that, you know, imagine a place where there are about 48,000 mosquitoes to begin with. However, not all of these mosquitoes would be able to manage to bite a human. So let's say only one in four mosquitoes manage to bite a human. So that means there are about 12,000 mosquitoes which are biting humans. Imagine further that, let's say initially only one human in a village of thousand are infected. So essentially, you know, of these 12,000 mosquitoes, only 12 mosquitoes are going to bite the infected human. Imagine that of these 12 mosquitoes, only one in every three 
would eventually survive to become infectious, you know, because they may be killed off by humans when they're biting their blood and so on. And so their mortality rate is pretty high. And so let's say there's a probability of only one third that is going to survive to become infectious. And so one third of 12 is four. So four mosquitoes survive to be infectious. And remember that only one in four mosquitoes managed to bite a human. So on average, only one of these four mosquitoes is going to bite a human, eventually passing the infection on to an uninfected human. And so therefore, although there are 40,000 mosquitoes to begin with, only one mosquito is going to be able to pass the infection to another human. And so therefore, if you can reduce the number to something substantially less than 48,000, you don't have to get it down all the way to zero, you should be able to make the probability extremely small that you would have any mosquito passing the malaria infection on forward to other humans. So of course, if there were more mosquitoes or more infected humans, there would be more new infections over time, but this is also balanced by infected individuals gradually recovering over time. And if recoveries occur faster than new infection, then you can actually eliminate the disease. And this is a wonderful insight which is arrived at simply by logical reasoning. What Ross arrived at was a conclusion that you need a critical density of mosquitoes for malaria to be sustained in a given area. As he said, malaria cannot persist in a community unless the anaphenins are so numerous that the number of new infections compensates for the number of recoveries. So the question came that, can you actually extend this insight beyond malaria? So malaria in a sense is uh, you know, a typical disease because it's spread not directly by contact between humans, but by an intermediate organism, a so-called vector, in this particular case, a mosquito. What about disease like flu or for that matter COVID, which spreads by direct contact between infected individuals? It turned out that Ross was ambitious enough to start thinking beyond malaria. And so after he came up with his mosquito theorem, between the years of 1916 and 1917, he started collaborating with a pioneering woman mathematician, Hilda Hudson, to develop a general theory of epidemics. He called this theory a priori pathometry because instead of trying to understand a posteriori, that is afterwards, why an epidemic behaved the way it did, Ross's theory tried to propose mechanism by which an epidemic spreads a priori so as to predict how it will develop over time. And he developed a very general theory, which he called the theory of happenings. So he said that imagine events which are such that it affects people independently at random. So this is a situation, for example, when, you know, for example, probability of having accidents. Okay? So a probability of having an accident is, of course, more or less uncorrelated between individual to individual. And so if you ask, you know, what's the fraction of people in a particular cohort to whom an accident happened, you find that initially, let's say, let's say accidents happen with a constant probability for a particular unit of time. So, so initially you see the number of people to whom at least one accident happened essentially increases linearly and then eventually it saturates. But now imagine events which happen or will, whose likelihood of happening increases if more, if there are already a large number of people already to whom such an event has happened. So this is the case of not just biological contagion, as in the case of epidemics, but also social contagion. So for example, are you more likely to buy a cell phone because lots of other people have bought already cell phones? Or for example, would you be more likely to invest in, let's say a new product, let's say Bitcoin, because you know some of the friends you know have already invested in Bitcoin. So more people you know buy into a particular idea, the more likely you are to buy into that idea. And so this basically brings us to the general concept of a contagion where an event is more likely to happen to someone if it already has happened to several other people in that person's neighborhood. So the fraction affected here actually rises exponentially with time rather than linearly as in the case here before it also saturates. <clears throat> 
And so the difference between independent and dependent happening is while in independent happening, there will be a slow but steady growth rate. In dependent happening, the rise, at least initially, is exponential, as you've already seen is the case for epidemics. So Ross essentially had this wonderful insight that contagion can not only happen in the case of epidemics, it can happen across a whole range of different phenomena. Unfortunately, that was more or less where his efforts stopped, and we had to wait for a few more years before the next stage of development of epidemic modeling came with the development of the so-called compartmental models of epidemic dynamics. So in the compartmental models of epidemic dynamics, which essentially form the bedrock of all modern epidemiological modeling today, or most of epidemiological modeling today, essentially depends upon dividing up an entire population into several pools. The simplest model envisions dividing up a population into susceptibles, those who have not yet had the disease, but are likely to catch the disease, infected, those who are currently down with the disease, and recovered, those who have had the disease, have come out of it, and are now immune to the disease. So how do you go from susceptible to the infected category? If a susceptible person means infected person, then with some rate beta, the susceptible person gets infected with the pathogen and enters the infected pool. On the other hand, an already infected person recovers with some rate gamma and enters the recovered pool. And so the entire process by which people enter the susceptible pool, go to the infected pool, and eventually end up in the recovered pool, are guided by two rates, the rate of infection spreading and the rate at which they recover. So the rate at which they recover is basically nothing but the reciprocal of the period for which a person is infectious. Let's call that quantity tau. So any model of epidemic spreading essentially involves doing something like this. You divide up your entire population into those who belong to the susceptible category, those who belong to the infected category, and those who belong to the recovered or removed category. And the important parameters that are governing how they will move from one category to the other is given by the probability of transmission of the uh, infection from an infected person to a susceptible person, the number of infected person, a susceptible person comes in contact with, and the average infectious period. And so what you have is the series of steps in which an infection causes a susceptible person to go from the category of susceptible individuals to the category of infected individuals, and then a recovery process by which a person in the infected category goes to the recovered or removed category. Of course, in principle now, if a vaccine exists for the disease, you could have another process, namely vaccination, by which you could actually have an individual go directly from the susceptible category to the recovered category with some probability pi, which is the probability with which vaccination happens. So, this idea was first mathematically formalized by two people, Kermak and McEndrick. McEndrick was also a medical doctor who was a protege of Ronald Ross. So in fact, he was one of the team which had gone to Sierra Leone to implement Ronald Ross's experiment, which was basically, you know, if you control the malaria population, you can control epidemics. And while returning with Ross after the failed experiment, Ross had converted McKendrick into trying out these ideas in a mathematical framework. So McKendrick was essentially trying this out on his own when one of his colleagues at the Edinburgh College of Physicians, Kermack, who was a talented chemist who had lost his eyesight in an accident at the laboratory, decided that after he had lost his eyesight, he really can't do chemistry, so he switched to mathematics. And Kermack turned out to be a gifted mathematician. So in collaboration, Kermack and McKendrick started developing the first mathematical model of compartmental 
epidemic spreading. So they used for simplicity the idea that let us imagine that any person in the population who is infected is likely to infect any other person in the population. So this is known as the idea of homogeneous mixing. That is, you are equally likely to come in contact with anybody else in the population. This is, of course, a simplicity. In reality, of course, we are not equally likely to meet everyone. We are far more likely to interact with our colleagues, with our friends, with our family members, than some random person on the street. Okay? But it turns out that if you do this simplification, you can actually come up with a very elegant model. So they essentially wrote down the following three equations whose content can be said very simply. So they said that, look, if you look at the change in the susceptible population, by how much does the susceptible population decrease? Essentially, it's decreasing by loss of individuals through new infections. And what is that number? It's just the rate at which infection occurs times the current susceptible population times the current infected population, because you have to have infected person meeting a susceptible person and with some rate beta, the susceptible person getting infected. And so therefore, it's this change is simply proportional to the product of the total number of susceptibles with the total number of infected with the proportionality rate just being this infection rate. What is the change in the infected population? Well, it depends on two things, right? Well, first it's growing because of new infections bringing, you know, people from the susceptible category into the infected category, but you're also losing people who are recovering and going to the recovered category. So the change in infected population is the growth through new infections minus the loss by the recovery of sick individuals. So the growth through in new infections is just the same term as we've seen before, except that this minus now becomes a plus because whatever is the loss for susceptible is a gain for the infected category. So it's beta times current susceptible times current infected population. But now you also have the loss by recovery. What is the recovery rate? It's simply one over tau, tau being the period for which you are infected, you are infectious, right? So that rate times the total number of people who are already infected will give you how many people would recover in the current instant. So those many people will recover and they have got to be subtracted from the gain you have from the susceptible pool by new infections. And finally, the change in recovered population, the increase in the recovered population is simply the growth that happens by recovery of the sick individuals. And this, as you have seen, is nothing but the rate of recovery, which is just the reciprocal of the infectious period times how many people are actually infected. So you just have three equations by solving which you can actually see over time how the number of infected is going to go down over time, how the number of recovered is going to gradually increase over time, and how the number of infected is going to gradually first increase and then decrease. And if you change the rate at which people come in contact, you can actually see how the peak of infection and when this peak occurs actually can change over time. So in this video, which I've taken from this blog, you can see how by changing the effective contact rate, and this you know you can implement, for example, by introducing quarantining measures or lockdown or whatever, you can actually not only bring down the total number of people who would be infected, you can also shift the period at which this peak will happen. So the big insight from this mathematical model that Kermak and McKendrick developed was that what is the condition for an epidemic to happen? So when, does it, when do you say that epidemic is happening? When the number of infections gradually increase over time. Now, this means that the change in the infected population has to be positive. The number of people who have currently gotten infected should be more than the number of people who have been infected earlier. In other words, the change, DIDT, has to be positive. But if we say that this change is positive, this means that this quantity on the right hand side has to be positive. What does that mean? That means this product beta times S times I has to be greater than I by tau. Now, if you cancel out I from both sides, this means that S, the total susceptible population has to be greater than one over the product of beta and tau. 
Now, as in the initial stage of an epidemic, the total susceptible population is the total population itself, it's N. We can now come up with a wonderful, simple condition for an epidemic to happen. It's simply that the product of the total population size, which is susceptible, times the rate at which infection can jump from a susceptible from an infected to a susceptible individual and the average infectious period, the product of these three quantities has to be greater than one. And we realize that this is nothing but the R0, the basic production number. So the basic production number is simply the product of the total susceptible population, the rate at which the infection spreads, and the period for which a person, once they've become infected, continues to be infectious. If the product is greater than one, then you will have an epidemic. However, if the product is less than one, you will not have an epidemic. You can actually prevent an epidemic. Now this immediately gives us a wonderful idea of how to control epidemics. If you can reduce N, or if you can reduce beta, or if you can reduce tau, or you can reduce any two, or you can reduce all three by some means, such that the product is less than one, you can actually prevent an epidemic. That's the wonderful lesson for public health. So you might ask, how do you control each of these quantities? How do you control tau? How do you control the average infectious period? So let's see what it means. An average infectious period means that the period during which a person has gotten infected but is free to infect everyone around herself. So if you can quickly detect a person and confine that person so that the person cannot pass the infection on, you can actually reduce tau. How do you reduce beta? How do you reduce the rate of infection spreading? Well, you can ask people to wear masks so you know they don't spread the pathogen or you can ask them to wash their hands so that it's very unlikely that you know they will contract the infection by hand contact so that would effectively reduce beta or you can ask them you know to have physical distancing that would also reduce beta in a way right? now you might ask okay how do you reduce the total susceptible population Sus population is what it is right well, it turns out actually there's a way you can reduce total susceptible population and that's by vaccination. So if you have a vaccine available to you, that means effectively what you're doing is you are reducing the total size of the susceptible population from N, the total population, to something much lower. So if you can bring it down sufficiently such that the product of the susceptible population size, the average rate of infection and the average infectious period is less than one, you could actually prevent any epidemic from happening. And so this tells you that in order to eradicate a disease through vaccination, you don't have to actually vaccinate each and every person on this planet. That's a wonderful idea because there are obviously many individuals on this world who are completely out of contact with civilization. Imagine the people in the North Sentinel Island, the Andaman chain of islands. They have never come in contact with civilization. The question of you know, giving them vaccine for, let's say, smallpox or for that matter, COVID is out of the question. So how do they ensure that you, know, you would nevertheless be, still be able to prevent any recurrence of the epidemic? The answer given by Kermak and McEnrick theory is very simple. It simply says you don't need to vaccinate everyone. All you need to infect is a critical number of people, which is simply given by one minus one by R0. So if you can vaccinate a num fraction of people greater than this number, you can actually stop any further recurrence of the epidemic. So for example, if you have R0 around two, then you have to essentially vaccinate more than 50% of the population to ensure that there are no further breakouts of the epidemic. Now, of course, this depends on an assumption the assumption is that the vaccine is 100% effective. So if you get vaccinated, there is 0% probability that you'll be able to catch the infection again. In reality, of course, you never get 100% effectiveness. And so you have to take that into account. And so essentially this number that is given by Kermak and McKendrick's theory is just the lower threshold. In practice, you always have to vaccinate many more than the number that is given by this minimal number, but it's still remarkable that you can actually stop epidemics by vaccinating less than 100% of individuals.
And the reason this works is that when you have vaccinated enough number of people, the few people who are still susceptible to the disease would be successfully able to hide themselves in a sea of people who have been immunized. So this is the concept of herd immunity. If enough number of people have been immunized either by prior exposure to the pathogen, you know, they had fallen sick, and so now therefore have natural immunity, or through vaccination, in which they have acquired the immunity, you can actually protect the remaining susceptible people whom the pathogen will never be able to find out because it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. The number of susceptible people are too few and very hard to find out in the sea of recovered individuals who are otherwise resistant to the infection. Now, of course, as I mentioned, Kermak and McKendrick's theory was a deliberate simplification. It assumes that everyone in a population is equally likely to infect everyone else. In reality, of course, social relations, physical nearness makes it more likely that we'll be coming in contact with some individuals rather than others. We are much more likely to talk to people who are our friends or our relatives than to some stranger. So how does this social network that each of us have affect how epidemics spread? So we can actually look at the workings of Kermak and McKendrick's basic compartmental model on a network. So what is a network? A network is anything which is defined by nodes which represent individuals and which are themselves connected by links, which are essentially the physical contact which allows contagion transfer. So for example, if we look at how does epidemics propagate in a real social network, we can take the case of uh, a Karnataka village for whom the complete social network has been mapped out and ask how would a disease modeled by a Kermak McKendrick model develop through the village? So it turns out that early on, the disease would very quickly affect everyone else. So a lot of people would become infected. So here the red colored nodes stand for the infected people. But a few people who had already gotten infected earlier would have now recovered and would be immune to the disease. However, over time, the recovered individuals would gradually lose immunity because the antibodies would you know, essentially be lost and they would start becoming susceptible once more. Okay? So over time, we find that the cycle of susceptible people becoming infected, becoming recovered, and eventually losing the, losing the immunity to become susceptible again goes on and on. And the whole village shows a recurrence of epidemic over time. And this gives us a handle as to how exactly social networks affect epidemic evolution. So what we find is that if you have society, social structures where people essentially talk more to people within their own communities, so where you know, people kind of cluster into communities, surprisingly, diseases is going to be persistent in those social networks for far longer than in social networks which are far more homogeneous, where there is no community organization. In networks with community organization, diseases would tend to stick around within a community for far longer and would reappear again and again and again. Whereas in networks which has no community structure, they will just quickly spread to the entire network and eventually disappear. So it turns out that the social networks that we have actually directly influence how an epidemic is going to evolve over time. And it's not just true for social network. If you look at the network of transportation, for example, if we look at how epidemics spread by people actually flying from one country to another using the airline transportation network, people have actually done studies ever since you know, network became uh, kind of a very oft used paradigm in scientific research. They have looked at, for example, at the 2003 severe acute respiratory syndrome outbreak, which first happened in Hong Kong, and looked at how the disease spread from Hong Kong to other countries around the world by the International Airline Transportation Network. And so you can do 
some rather cool simulations where you can say that suppose the disease had not started in Hong Kong, but had started, let's say, New York, or maybe started in London. How would the disease have spread using the pattern of international airline network? And you find that you can actually predict how exactly a disease would spread from country to country using the international airline transportation network. So for example, the actual simulation fits the observed data for SARS fairly accurately. And it's not just true for international airline transportation, but you can even look at it within a particular country. So for example, a group of scientists looked at how SARS spread in Taiwan in 2003, and they found that this essentially happened by people essentially congregating in hospitals. So if you look at you know, the network of the confirmed SARS patients and the suspected SARS patients and the places that they congregated in, you find that it forms a network where the critical you know, places in which the infection transmitted from individual to individual happen to be the hospitals. Now, this sounds very surprising, right? You go to hospitals to get well, not to get sick. But it turns out that in an epidemic, a hospital often plays, unfortunately, the role of a facilitator of infection. So a sick individual goes to a hospital and unwittingly infects maybe a physician, maybe an attending nurse, and then that person can infect other patients. And when those patients go back home, they can infect their family members. And in this way, essentially, the infection can spread far and wide. Now, knowing this can actually allow us to identify the bottlenecks of infection transmission, and they can actually give us targets for implementing measures such as quarantines, which are, of course, examples of non-pharmaceutical intervention. So if you don't have vaccines, then what we need to do are non-pharmaceutical interventions, like essentially preventing people from traveling from one place to another, asking people not to physically congregate in one place, closing schools, closing workplaces, asking people to stay at home, lockdowns, and so on. Now, lockdown, of course, has become you know, a very common usage, but it's surprising because until COVID came, essentially no one had ever thought of a nationwide lockdown as a practical measure for preventing or stopping epidemics. And the reason is, although of course lockdowns do play a very important role in essentially slowing down the rate at which epidemics spread, it also has a very major social and economic cost. Now, we can use modeling to essentially balance such costs and risk of spreading. So for example, there's this group who kind of proposed that maybe we can have alternating quarantine cycles where we can divide up the population into multiple groups where each group is allowed to work for a particular week and then asked to take the subsequent week off. And then the other half of the population is asked to work the next week and then take their half of the and then take the next week off. The idea being that, yes, when you're working in a particular week, that particular half of the population, some of the members will be exposed and would likely be infected. But since we're asking them to take the next week off, during the week that they're off, they're essentially going to come down with a symptomatic infection, and then they can be asked to isolate themselves until they recover. The remaining people who don't show the symptoms can then again go back to their work in the next week, and this goes on until eventually the epidemic runs its course. However, there are other costs of non-pharmaceutical intervention, in particular lockdown, because you know you do face economic costs of you know like loss of earning, on which can also lead to psychological stress and so on, and so individuals do have an incentive not to comply. So although you know that if everybody complies, clearly the epidemic is not going to make much headway, you can argue in the following manner that, you know, suppose everyone is being good and stays at home, you know, I can just go out, you know, one person cannot make all that much difference. So, you know, I can go and enjoy the benefit of actually going out and traveling while others basically bear the cost 
of staying at home. But of course, if everyone argues that way, no one will be staying at home, and of course, the lockdown would be a failure. So you can also use mathematical modeling to study how individuals decide whether to comply or not with this non pharmaceutical intervention rules based upon their perception of the risk of catching the disease versus the incentive not to comply, not to take advantage of not complying with uh, the measures which have been put in place, such as lockdown. So we have done simulations which show that if you do not have compliance, if, the, if none of the individuals actually comply, then of course you will have an enormously high epidemic, but it will also quickly run its course and the population is going to come out after a while of the epidemic. But if you have partial compliance, where some people are complying and others are not, you know, based upon their perception of, you know, how much at risk they are of catching the disease, you could actually have multiple peaks. So you could have wave after wave of the epidemic as people become very cautious at the height of a wave, they decide to, you know, comply with all the uh, rules which have been put in place. But as soon as it starts coming down, they become lacklidious soon. They start going out. And of course, the disease is not yet gone, so it starts bouncing back. So again, it starts peaking, at which point people again start complying with the rules. They again go back. And then once it's coming down again, again, people start coming out. And in this way, you can have successive waves, each of which are, of course, coming down in intensity, but which would make the disease persist for far longer. And so in a way, the multiple waves of disease that you see could essentially be just a consequence of people partially complying, but occasionally also not complying with the non-pharmaceutical interventions which are put in place. So at conclusion, I'd like to uh, stress that one of the most important insights that modeling has brought to our understanding of epidemics is this concept of a reproduction number. So as I mentioned, the production number is actually made up of multiple factors. It is built up of generation time, that is a period of infectiousness plus the latent period for which you, know, you have the infection but you're not showing any effect so far. Then the average number of contacts with infectious individuals, the probability that a contact between the infection and a susceptible will result in the susceptible becoming infected. So that's the rate at which the infection jumps and the number of people in the population who are susceptible. Now, it turns out that if you can break down your reproduction number into these four components, it actually gives you ideas about how to control the epidemic. So for example, you could focus on rapid detection and isolation of infectious individuals. So this will reduce the generation time. You could implement physical distancing, quarantine, lockdowns, so this will essentially reduce the average number of contacts with infectious individuals. You could ask people to practice hygiene, washing of hands. You could also, of course, have you know, changes in the weather. So for example, if you have high humidity, you could have the aerosols in which, for example, COVID pathogen spreads quickly falling to the ground. And so this reduces the probability that a contact between an infection and a susceptible will result in the susceptible becoming infected. It reduces the infection rate. Finally, if a vaccine is available, you can actually reduce the number of people in the population who are susceptible. So essentially, it controls this fourth item. So you can control any or all of these by your public health measures, and each of them would contribute in its own way to control the epidemic. So that, in a sense, is one of the most practical benefit that modeling has brought to our understanding of epidemics. So let me end by thanking my uh, collaborators, uh, Somya Yusari, uh, Chandrasekhar, uh, Dr. T. Jason, and Anand Pathak at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, who have helped me with discussions and you know, of various assistances at different periods to analyze the data of COVID epidemic. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, CSSE at Johns Hopkins University for making their COVID-19 data available to researchers around the world. And finally, I'd like to thank the Center for Complex Systems and Data Science supported by the Department of Atomic Energy Government of India for the generous funding which has made our research into epidemiology possible. And I thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so 
we got a lot of information regarding this now i have a very uh, i have many questions but one question that is knocking me again and again and that is primarily the question of many of our common visitors is that given the situation of india and the kind of compliance that we are seeing in real life whether these kind of models can uh, take into account of all those factors and predict the onset of another surge that is in news for some days okay so one of the issues that you know i often um, have to explain is that epidemiological modeling cannot you know accurately tell you when exactly a particular epidemic is going to happen simply because when exactly an outbreak is going to happen is dependent on so many chance factors which by definition you know are unpredictable so the purpose of modeling is not to tell you you know exactly when the third wave is going to happen but rather what could be the intensity of third wave if it does happen what could be the likely you know period at which the third wave might happen you know you, know, you kind of look at the probabilities of this and more importantly modeling basically gives you an idea of what kind of policy decisions might be successful or you know what could be the outcome of certain policy decisions so for example you know if you have school closures versus for example if you have complete lockdown what would be the effect on the overall numbers as a result of this policy decisions so i gave this example where this group has actually considered this you know alternate quarantining scheme where they think that you know what if you allow half of the population to work for let's say alternate weeks and the other half of the population to work on the other weeks okay so you can actually carry out this kind of a virtual experiment in the computer and you can actually ask you know would it be better if you have let's say make them work for let's say one week each or is it like two weeks each and so on but you could ask you know what would be the effectiveness of other kinds of procedures like for example what if you actually ask people to work for let's say two days then take off for two days and then work for the next two days and so on is there like optimal period which you can alternate between people which would result in the lowest rate of spread of the epidemic so that's where the real utility of epidemic modeling comes in no allowing you to do virtual experimentation in the computer so that you can find out the effectiveness of certain policy decisions which would otherwise be extremely costly for us to find out by trial and error i got it and in fact i think that these kind of modelings are really going to help in case of any future epidemic or pandemic that might take place so wonderful wonderful i am sure that uh, we'll have many questions for you in near future so we'll be uh, again reaching back to you with the questions from our visitors and um, there will be many anxious parents who will be going through this presentation because everybody wants to know that when the schools are going to open and whether it is safe for our children to send to schools given this situation so uh, once we get all those questions we'll again get in touch with you but for the time being thanks very much thank you a lot from science city and uh, hope that we will interact more in near future thank you sir thank you thank you very much